Hey, thank you, Jeffrey, and um, thanks, you all. thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd much rather be in Dubrovnik. I'm, I'm sitting in um, a very rainy Gillingham in Kent in England and uh, uh, regretting the whole lockdown business, but it's still good to be able to participate and um, I wish you all the best to look at what you're doing. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit about myself. I, I did um, my PhD, um, it seems like a million years ago now, uh, on the NATO intervention in Kosovo. I was looking at the, the legality of it and looking at that clash between legality and morality, um, which I'm going to talk about today. And since then, I've been working on laws governing the use of force, particularly humanitarian intervention, a little bit on self-defense, but mostly humanitarian intervention and um, state building in, in Kosovo. And more recently, I've been working on the um, whole issue of transitional justice, but again, with a specific focus on the the new court in Kosovo, which has obviously been in the news a lot recently. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess, you know, in, in terms of my, my views on this, what, I, what I'd kind of like to draw out today is, is, you know, there's a lot of anniversaries at the moment. Um, there has been for the last couple of years. Last year was the 20th anniversary of, of NATO's intervention in um, uh, Kosovo. And um, at the moment, this is the week of the 25th anniversary of the uh, massacre at, at Srebrenica. Uh, and obviously, um, 20, last year was the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. So it's a, in the last sort of 18 months, there's been a lot of reflections on uh, what we've learned and what we've done and all these kinds of things. And um, I edited a special issue of a, of a journal reflecting on the um, 20th anniversary of the intervention in Kosovo. And, you know, it's one of the um, chapters I put up um, to the... Um, the online resource that if anybody wants to read some of those, you can have a look at it. But uh, I guess in, in terms of that, you know, the, these two interventions, the, the Bosnia one in 95 and the Kosovo one in 99, uh, tend to be looked at as more successful than many of the other interventions that happened afterwards, particularly obviously Iraq and Afghanistan, and more later um, Libya. And I guess what I'm gonna try and look at today then is kind of think in terms of, um, has anything improved? you know, how, what did we learn from these two um, cases? And, you know, what was the problem, let's say in 95 and 99? Uh, what was the nature of that problem? And what were the attempts made to solve that? And have those attempts been um, successful? Um, if anybody wants to ask me a question as I'm speaking, please do as well. I, I'm very keen on it to be interactive. So don't feel like, you know, if you, if you want to put your hand up, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and um, address anything. So yeah, I mean, just to give a bit of context to it, at the, the end of the Cold War, um, brought about a huge amount of optimism um, regarding human rights protection. And you had the, the whole idea of Fukuyama's idea at the end of history that the Western powers were now going to spread democracy across the world. There was no um, plausible alternative to liberal democracy. Communism and fascism had been defeated and now the task was just to spread this good stuff. Um, you also had uh, George W. Bush, sorry, not George W. Bush, George Bush Sr.'s um, idea of a new world order, which, you know, the, the, the speech he gave in 91, um, it very often overlooks speech, but this is the kind of the newly triumphant leader of the most powerful state in human history. And, and in that speech, he spoke about the, the new era being led by the UN, uh, not the US, which was quite, you know, again, gave people a lot of pause for thought and a sense that maybe this is now going to be a world governed by law rather than kind of, you know, um, real politique. And of course, certain things did happen, you know, that, that gave people, um, again, the confidence to think positively about the world. It was the Security Council mandated intervention in, in Kuwait. There was also the, um, uh, again, the UN mandated intervention in Somalia. There was no fly zones over Iraq. And this was all in the early part of the 1990s. So, you know, by that stage, there was, you know, optimism was rife. And we were now in this new era of human rights protection and a more proactive UN. However, by 95, that optimism had largely um, dissipated. You had the um, genocide in Rwanda, obviously. You had the, the very embarrassing US uh, retreat um, from Somalia and obviously you had um, the siege of Sarajevo um, from 92 to 95 um, in full view of the international community people being um, shot in the street uh, and then of course you had um, Srebrenica. So by the mid-1990s, by, by the time Srebrenica happened I think a lot of the optimism had, had dissipated. People did feel oh my god you know this was meant to be a new world order. This was meant to be a new era for the UN. Um, human rights were meant to be paramount. What's gone wrong? And I think what was clear was that the, the fall of the Soviet Union um, 
you know that that had been the the, the east west conflict had been used as a as an excuse as an explanation for why international law hadn't achieved very much or the un hadn't achieved very much in the cold war so there was an assumption that now that the Soviet union is gone you know there'll be consensus will be more easily achieved at the security council and we'll be able to mandate all these wonderful things around the world but clearly that didn't come to pass the impact of um, political will on the enforcement of international law um, was still a major problem so that i think goes to the heart of the issue um, which is the, the nature of the international legal regime regarding the protection and promotion of human rights and i think it's important to remember that the, the un charter and, and supplementary international law up to a point but certainly the un charter wasn't uh, a document designed to protect and promote human rights if you go through the un charter there are a couple of oblique references to human rights but very very little about the enforcement uh, of human rights it's much more orientated towards um, the rights of, of states the sovereign rights of states and also interstate conflict um, it was largely the charter and, and the, the powers given to the security council was largely uh, conceived as a means by which war between the great powers could be averted. Um, not necessarily wars between the great powers and smaller states, and certainly not conflicts inside states. Um, hence, we have this ultimate power placed within the permanent five members of the Security Council, uh, the veto, the infamous veto power. And this wasn't an accident. This was a very um, conscious decision to bring power uh, into the centre of this new international legal regime. So it's, a, it's what Nigel White, a British academic, describes as a, a, a realist core in an institutionalist framework. So you, you have lots of nice ideas about law and human rights and all that, but at the very core, the means by which it's enforced is inherently um, political. So as the Cold War um, ensured there were no changes to how law was enforced because of this split within the Security Council. Any attempts to change the way in which the UN operated were almost impossible. There was two reforms made to the UN during the Cold War period and, and both were very minor related to non-permanent members of the Security Council. There was one, for example, the number was increased, but tiny, tiny little changes. There was certainly no possibility of changing the mechanisms by which international law was enforced. So as we had a kind of a stalemate regarding the mechanisms by which international law was enforced, we also had this very different trend um, whereby supplementary, supplementary international law expanded so that by the start of the 1990s there was a massive body of laws governing a wide array of human rights from you know, genocide to racial discrimination and gender discrimination. So you, you certainly couldn't say at the beginning of the 1990s the problem is we don't have laws. There was a massive body of laws. There was no shortage there. The problem essentially was how do we enforce these laws? Right? So there was a clash between the, the very lofty normative aspirations of the laws and the conservative mechanisms <coughs> excuse me, of law enforcement. So this was you know, a, a, a building trend that was exposed when the Cold War ended. <coughs> excuse me. And when the Cold War ended, you, you had obviously this, like I say, this optimism about the, the new world order, but there was also another development that aided the proliferation of human rights discourse, which was the emergence of um, global civil society in the form of non-governmental organizations. Now there had obviously been human rights NGOs during the Cold War, Amnesty for example, um, but there was a sudden massive proliferation of these groups in the early 1990s. And what these groups did was highlight uh, conflicts around the world and bring these conflicts to the attention of people, particularly in the West, and say, look what's happening in country X, Y, and Z. And they were aided in the, the means in the process of so doing by the new technological innovation by CNN and obviously later on by the internet. So we were now as citizens of the West uh, bombarded with images of suffering abroad and asked what are you going to do about it and there was a sense that there was this what um, Martha Finmore described as a boomerang effect whereby people suffering in a particular state would appeal to non-governmental organizations they would take up their case, bring it to the attention of the general public in the West. The general public would then say to their government, what are you doing about what's happening over there? And then the government would be forced to respond to the general public's clamor um, for action. So it all looked like it was moving um, in the right direction. And it was this kind of perfect storm for the emergence of the new discourse on humanitarian intervention. But the, the problem, as I said, was that all this relied largely on political will. So, 
to get states to intervene to protect human rights in whatever country you have to be concerned about wasn't a matter of any legal duty. No state has a legal duty to intervene um, to protect people from human rights violations in another state. There is laws that say states can't do certain things to their own people, but there isn't anything that imposes a duty upon states to respond to these violations in other states. Even the Genocide Convention, all you're expected to do as a state there is bring the matter to the attention of the Security Council. There's no compulsion on you as a state to actually intervene to stop that. Um, so the response to Bosnia, which was a kind of a test case for this new optimism, showed that you know, Western states were not prepared to act as the world's police. They weren't going to say to the UN, here's all our troops, and you use them whenever you think it's necessary. Force was only ever going to be deployed if the state in question uh, wanted it to be used, not because it was in the UN's interests or to defend humanity. So states essentially continued to prioritise their own national interests ahead of the protection of human rights in a strategically, what they would consider to be strategically unimportant places, or where the costs of action in terms of their relations with other states were, were deemed too high. The result was that, that Bosnia was left to endure um, the, the years of violence because consensus at the Security Council was impossible, but also because uh, the Western powers did not want to get bogged down in a Vietnam type um, scenario, as they often said. Uh, there was a feeling as well in the early years of the, the conflict in Bosnia that, that nothing could be achieved by air power alone. Um, Colin Powell in particular in the US and in, in the George Bush senior administration made this point regularly. So the choice for the West in terms of their response to Bosnia seems to be uh, we have to send in a massive number of ground troops and basically get involved in a civil war or you know, do nothing. And if we send our troops in on the ground, they're going to be killed by the Serbs or by the Bosniaks or by the Croats. The people in London and Paris and Washington, the general public will not tolerate our troops coming home in body bags from a country they'd never heard of um, was, was largely the, the rationale. So there was unfortunately in that situation then national interests of these states preventing the kind of the right thing um, to be done, which explains largely um, why, you know, despite the global civil society activists and the NGOs and the journalists being on the ground in Sarajevo reporting on this hideous violence taking place for years and years and years, very little was actually done. Um, but eventually, obviously, the scale of the Serbian attack seemed to suggest that, that um, uh, Bosnia was, uh, as a state, was untenable. Um, and there was much to suggest that Western states tacitly supported the cleansing of Srebrenica, uh, Zepa and Garajda, the eastern enclaves in, in Bosnia, but that they didn't want to see the Bosnian Serbs take Sarajevo. And then we had the market uh, um, bombing um, in August um, '95 which, you know, again, shocked the world and seemed to suggest that the Bosnian Serbs were now seeking to take Sarajevo, which was um, unconscionable for the West. So that then led to the airstrikes um, that NATO um, undertook in, in August and September. It was also, again, a very important factor is that um, Clinton was looking for re-election at the time and his opponent, Bob Dole, was very, very proactive on the Bosnian issue and, and was certainly far more um, gung-ho than, than Clinton was at the time and, and Clinton was losing ground um, to Bob Dole in that particular conversation. So again, and this isn't a conspiracy theory, it's just the reality of, of, of politics. You know, governments that are looking to be re-elected are obviously going to be mindful of doing something that is momentarily um, popular. Um, so the airstrikes that did happen in Bosnia in August and September 1995 um, I think we're welcome with the vast majority of people who observed what was happening on the ground in, in Bosnia and certainly in, in Sarajevo and, and clearly um, the massacre in Srebrenica. Uh, and, it, and, and they worked effectively in terms of that they did um, bring um, Milosevic to the table at Dayton and did lead to the Dayton um, peace accords. But the key point to remember with respect to this is that this, these airstrikes were a function of a coincidence between political will and human suffering. They weren't a, a, a response born of any legal duty. They didn't signal any new law had come, had come into play or anything like that. It was just that there was this perfect storm of political will and human um, suffering. A similar resolve was clearly not shown in, in, in Rwanda or Somalia. And it's um, important to, to remember that, you know, by the time these airstrikes took place, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people had already died uh, in Bosnia. Um, now, what happens next in terms of Kosovo, I think obviously builds on uh, Bosnia. The, the argument that you couldn't achieve anything through airstrikes was no longer um, plausible. 
clearly the airstrikes in Bosnia had been effective. So when it came to Kosovo, there was a sense that, well, maybe we can intervene without actually intervening, which again was a more attractive proposition um, for Western states. It was clearly um, risk-free. Um, and what happened in, in Kosovo was, you know, unlike uh, Bosnia, um, was a, a, an action that seemed to be um, taken before something dreadful happened. Now, clearly, anybody who knows anything about what was happening in Kosovo up to that time will tell you about Bacek and will tell you about lots of other hideous massacres that occurred in Kosovo up to uh, before March 1999. But certainly the scale of the violence in Kosovo was nothing like as bad as it was in Bosnia. So in this case, it seemed as though the right thing was done fairly quickly. Um, and it was done in a sustained way. The bombing campaign in, in Kosovo lasted um, more than 11 weeks, um, as opposed to the, the far shorter campaign in Bosnia. And uh, as much as the intervention was supported by the vast majority of Western states and most global, global civil society um, activists, it's important to remember it didn't have um, Security Council authorization, clearly because if, if, you know, the, the, if a resolution had been put to the Security Council asking for the authority to intervene in Kosovo, um, Russia would have said no, quite obviously. So it, it was famously characterized by the Independent International Commission on Kosovo as illegal but legitimate. And that's a very interesting idea, that something can be illegal, but at the same time legitimate. And what that highlights, and this is something that has happened throughout history, is that there are times where <clears throat> law hasn't kept pace with morality. And you can see that, you know, the, you know, the, the example I often give to my students or respects of things like that would, of course, be um, uh, Martin Luther King's civil rights movement in America or, you know, campaigns to legalize homosexuality in the UK. And there comes a point where what we think is OK for the law to say you can and can't do changes. And you have this contestation between the emerging moral norm that says, actually um, black people should be allowed to have exactly the same rights as white people or homosexuals should have exactly the same rights as, as heterosexuals there is this contestation and this clash and Kosovo highlighted this there was something wrong here if action taken to relieve the suffering of people on the ground in, in, in Kosovo which was widely seen as legitimate was actually illegal well, and surely we have to do something about that um, so you have that as an interesting starting point with respect to the, the debate that, that came after um, uh, Kosovo. The thing to remember again with respect to Kosovo um, is that th this wasn't, again, this didn't happen in a vacuum and it didn't necessarily highlight some new disposition. A lot of people got very excited about what happened in Kosovo. But again, like Bosnia, you could certainly point to a number of, of, I mean, all you have to do is read Bill Clinton's speech, I think, on the eve of the intervention on the 23rd of March, 1999. So it's, it's again, it's not a conspiracy theory. States are, are, are generally very honest about this. So Clinton in 1999 or Obama in 2011 regarding Libya, these guys are very open about why they're intervening. They say it's because there's, as Clinton said, a moral imperative, but he also made the point that there, we have key strategic interests in this region. So very few people at the time, whether it was Clinton or Blair or Schroeder or any of these guys said, we're doing this purely because we can't sleep at night thinking about the cost of Albanians. They said that there was a mixture of national interests and humanitarian suffering. And I, you know, personally, that, that's fine. You know, I think mixed motives are okay. But the problem is, if we only have an effective response to, hum to mass human rights violations, when there is key strategic interests involved, then we're going to have a pattern that's very inconsistent. We're going to have some people like the Kosovo Albanians saved in 1999, whereas we're going to have other people like the Kurds in Turkey who were ignored uh, in 1999. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who were, you know, on, on one level supportive of what happened in 1999, were also kind of saying, you know, let's not get too, to get too excited about this. People like Simon Chesterman, for example, who wrote, wrote a great book called Just War, or Just Peace, um, and in that book, he talks about how Kosovo and the intervention there actually fits perfectly into this pattern of selective humanitarian intervention. It isn't something strange and new. It fits into this very selective pattern of humanitarian intervention. But it did highlight, as I say, that something needed to be um, uh, changed. And it led to this debate. There was two major debates in the General Assembly in late 1999 about what to do about humanitarian intervention going forward. And Kofi Annan famously asked this question, okay, if it's illegal, what are we going to do the next time there's a Rwanda or Srebrenica? And in answer to his question, 
the Canadian government commissioned uh, um, a group of um, esteemed academics and lawyers and people like that to uh, uh, in investigate this and come up with recommendations. And their report, they were the International Commission on Intervention of State Sovereignty, and their report was published in December 2001, and it was called The Responsibility to Protect. And it's become the most prominent solution to the problem Kosovo highlighted, let's say. Um, it was, as I say, just a report in 2001, but in 2005, it was actually rec recognized by all the world states at the 2005 um, UN World Summit. So it became, you know, not just a kind of academic reflections on what we should do, it actually didn't exactly become law, but it became, you know, it did have some legal um, character. And lots of people got very excited about it. Um, people are still very excited about it. Um, Alex Bellamy, Professor Alex Bellamy in Australia, maybe one of the most vocal proponents of it, he said it's changed the world. Um, and and Marie Slaughter, who was a, you know, an academic and also a member of the US administration under Obama, said it was the biggest change to um, law since the Magna Carta. So there's lots of these extraordinary statements about responsibility to protect. Now, if we then today in 2020 look back at 95, the intervention of Bosnia and 99, the intervention of Kosovo and say, OK, there was these two interventions that led to this consensus that something needed to be changed. And then this R2P, as it's known, Responsibility Protect, came about as the solution to that. Can we evaluate how well it has um, uh, um, fared in the last 20 years? Now, I think, again, if you were to take a, a you know, a realistic view of the last 20 years, um, I think you'd conclude that it hasn't changed anything. If you think about the litany of failures that have happened since 2005, initially, first test case of R2P was Darfur. Um, clearly, the international response to Darfur wasn't um, sufficiently good. In 2009, there was the massacres in Sri Lanka. Clearly, again, where was the responsibility to protect? From 2011 on, we've had the um, extraordinary violence in Syria. There's also been um, violence in Bahrain and Yemen and, and Myanmar, these very high profile cases. And in each of these uh, instances, people have asked the question, where is the UN? You know, where is the responsibility to protect? Why hasn't this thing um, worked? And in my work on this, um, I've always made the point that responsibility to protect but was never going to work because all it did was come up with this fairly effective slogan, responsibility to protect, but it didn't change anything. It hasn't changed international law in the slightest. It's a restatement of existing international law. It is at most a kind of a norm. Now, the whole literature on norms is, is you know, to me, a kind of a waste of time in many respects, but I did write a book about it because it was the kind of the argument that people who believe RTP works always come back to. It's a norm and we have to give it time and this kind of thing. Um, but if you look into the, the literature on norms, there is there are many norms that you know people will cheerfully say yes I agree with, but in practice they, it doesn't change their behaviour and that's why I, I describe it in, in um, my latest book as a hollow norm. So if you look at any general assembly debates in the last ten years about responsibility to protect, what you find is all these states file into the the, the building in you in, in in New York in, in the UN building in New York. And they say wonderful things. We love the responsibility protected. So some of the, the most kind of emphatic um, supporters of the responsibility protector, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, they all cheerfully say, yeah, we think it's great. Because they know it doesn't change anything. It doesn't create any duty upon them to do anything. It doesn't impose any punishment upon them if they don't protect their own people. And what it has become then is, is, is almost kind of the worst of both worlds. It doesn't solve the problem. And in many ways, it makes the problem worse because it allows these states to appear to be um, concerned with human rights because they're able to use this vacuous phrase, ha uh, safe in the knowledge, it doesn't actually have to change um, their behavior. So they can go back to their domestic publics and, and say, look, we've signed up to the responsibility to protect. You can no longer say that we don't care about human rights. When in actual fact, it hasn't actually changed anything. Um, and finally, just to kind of point regarding this in, in terms of the trends since 1999, just to kind of finish with this, um, R2P hasn't changed anything, I would suggest. But in tandem with this, we have another issue which has emerged. And, you know, I think the discussion prior to that, we just kind of touched on that, which is the rise of powers like Russia and China. So a world that existed in 1999, 
where you have absolute Western dominance and Western states, you know, according to most people, are more inclined towards human rights and democracy promotion. That world is no longer with us. Now, the great powers include Russia, China, India, Brazil and South Africa, the BRICS as they're known. Um, and they're not in any way as interested in human rights promotion as, as, as Western states. Uh, and the Western states themselves have become much more inward looking um, and reluctant to um, protect and promote human rights overseas. And, and again, if you, if you look at that trend in tandem with the vacuous solution that was R2P, and also look at, let's say, Freedom House or Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, their annual reports, certainly for the last 10 years, highlight a very clear disintegration in global respect for human rights. So if anything, the situation for the protection and promotion of human rights today is worse than it was in, in, in 1999, despite the kind of consensus after Bosnia, after Rwanda, after Srebrenica, after Kosovo, um, that something had to change. Nothing actually has. And the result is, unfortunately, that um, I think human rights are in a more perilous position um, than they've been in, in 20, 25 years. And uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, Aidan, thank you very much. And uh, I know this is going to generate a lot of questions. Um, I've already got a couple, but I hope others uh, may ask them. But as a matter of interest, if you were uh, given uh, supernatural powers for half an hour and could achieve one thing, what would you do? Related to human rights or to just my life in general? <laughs> no, I mean in relation to the problem yeah, that you've I identified. I, there you are. You have, you, you've been given this power just for half an hour. So you can only really do a couple of things or one. What would you do? Yeah, well, it's, it's a very interesting question. I, it, uh, I don't want to keep talking about books I've written or anything like that, but it, I think it's just important to, to know in, in 2012, I think, I, I, a book I wrote about the responsibility to protect. In, in that book, mm -hmm. I said, as I've been saying my whole life, and I'm boring everybody to death at this stage, RTP doesn't work, RTP doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and of course, people did say to me, okay, you know, um, what's, your, what's your big idea? Have you got any solution? What would you like to see happen? which is a good question, I think. Um, what I suggested in, in 2012, and I would love it if there had been much more work done on this, um, not by me, because I, I, you know, I'm not qualified to, to do it, but there, you know, there's a lot of better placed people who could have looked into this more, was that in 1999, there was a, genu a genuine consensus among states um, that, that the international legal order was flawed and that something needed to change. You know, if, if, if more people at that point had looked into the means by which the enforcement of international law could be made more consistent, then I think we would have gone in a much better direction than this idea of moral norms and ethical debates. Because what RTP is ultimately premised on is the notion that we can persuade states to do the right thing. It's, it's fundamentally based on the idea that, that and, you know, this, this comes from academics and from journalists and, and Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, when asked how does R2P work, they would say we create this normative consensus and we put pressure on states to do the right thing and they won't be able to resist this pressure. So for example, in early 2012, Alex Bellamy and, and Tim Dunn wrote an article about what was happening in Syria. And they said the, the pressure from the international community, including global civil society activists and journalists and all these people, the pressure from these people on Russia will become too much for Russia to bear. And Russia will eventually have to stop supporting Assad. So their prediction was good people will write all these letters of protest and demand Russia stop supporting Assad. And even you know, Putin will eventually have to say, okay, sorry, we have to stop. Clearly it didn't happen. Clearly Putin didn't care what um, Western human rights organizations thought of him. So that strategy hasn't worked. If there'd be more effort put into trying to enforce international law in an objective way that was non-political, by strengthening, for example, the UN Secretariat and creating some kind of UN rapid reaction force, let's say, that wasn't an army or a, or a force that was dependent on states to be mobilized, but was at the disposal of the UN itself, then that could be something that could be interesting. And a lot of people have looked into that previously, but the, the, the work has been ignored. You know, for, for example, Hans Kelsen, when he wrote about the UN when it was first established, he said it's, it's a primitive system. 
because it's, 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 a, it's a legal system that can't be enforced at the moment. But his hope was things like the emergence of a new means by which the UN could enforce its own, own laws consistently would help it evolve from being a primitive system to a more advanced system. But that, that hasn't happened. And, and as I say, if I, could, if I could wave the magic wand that you spoke about, it would be to get people to stop writing about moral norms and, and write more about how do, we, how do we change legal orders to make them more consistent and how do we actually achieve that internationally. Right. Thank you very much for that. We've already got three questions lined up and, in, and if Arif and Nick read their chats, we may have two more, otherwise I'll ask them. But in order, Holly, you have a question. Um, hi, uh, thanks for your talk. It's super interesting. Um, but basically I wanted to ask whether, obviously so you're saying that it's roughly a primitive system at the moment and you kind of suggested that maybe there should be more legal enforcement, but do you think that there should therefore be a legal duty? Would you go as far as saying that it should be that extreme? And perhaps kind of piggybacking off that is the reason why it seems to be all why an international law seems to be failing is because it's kind of an, a macrocosm of an uh, individual country's governance system. So whereas perhaps states in this case would represent individuals and the UN might represent, you know, the government, international law is so much harder because instead of just having different views in government, we've got polar opposite interests from different states and given how new it is in human history, we can almost expect it to be in this primitive state and for it to be failing. And so hence, you know, why the law is always behind. Yeah, yeah, thanks Holly. Um, I think, I mean, I think we would all find it, we would, we would reject um, a system domestically, uh, a legal system. A system of laws, uh, if you will. We would, we would, we would not want to live in a system domestically if it demanded that we, as individuals, enforce the laws. Because you know, uh, and again, I've, I've I've written about this before in other places that that, that we have created. You know, the, the classic idea of the state is that you need the state to exist above individuals, so that we you can enforce the laws that individuals themselves will not enforce against each other. So I don't think it's fair to say to somebody living in, in Gillingham or, or, or Chatham, you have to enforce the law regarding the, you know, um, men are not allowed to beat their wives. If you think that's happening, you have to enforce that law. We would say, no, it's, we call the police. And we've created these structures um, precisely because individuals, I think, are morally entitled not to um, run into a, a, a room where there's a, you know, six, so, so here you're creating a, a parallel between the individuals and states, but obviously, where no, well, I'm saying that if any legal system is going to work, sorry, I just missed no, that. One. No, I'm kind of saying that if you look at a, 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 the normative legal order domestically, one of the key features of it is that you, you have the enforcement of law by a duty bound group, namely the police. So, I'm, in terms of your point about duty, I absolutely think that is. Um, essentially, there has to be some body, some group within the legal order that is duty bound to respond and has the capacity to respond to that. Now, in the international system, we simply don't have that. It's, it's down to individual states to, first of all, authorise a response, which is the problem of five members of the Security Council, but also it is down to individual states to, to volunteer their troops to that particular response. So you end up in crazy situations like the UN peacekeeping mission to Darfur, where the UN agrees to send a peacekeeping mission in there, and then all the states run out of the room when they're asked to um, supply troops for that. So, so duty, I think, is, is the essential word. Um, and, and you brought it up. You, mean has... legal, you seem to mean only ever legal duty. And if I understood you correctly, you would abandon the notion of your duty to uh, save the drowning child or to intervene in a medical operation if you see he's about to cut off the wrong leg or whatever else. You don't accept a moral duty that binds an individual or could bind a state. No, I, th I mean, the, the drowning child is, is, is a very clear cut example, but it, you know, one of the examples that I, you know, I tend to kind of present to people is, is that one about if you knew that there was something terrible happening next door in, to, to you, if you knew that a, a man was beating his wife next door, 
what would you do if you can't ring the police, right? Should you go in next door and say to the guy, I want you to stop? Should you be let's, uh, let's ask the group that. Let's yeah. just ask the group that. Uh, very simple example. You know somebody's being badly beaten next door. You cannot get through to the police. You live in a, in a remote island. Do you do nothing or something? Those who would do nothing, hands up. Maybe the order of asking the questions was tendentious. Those who would do something, hands up, because there may be some don't knows. One, two, three, four. Okay, of those voting, Aiden, I think there's, uh, there's a, 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 a sense, but you may say this is a sense of naivety. No, that's, What's it's your it's response? To, it, that, that's the kind of, the, that's the first question that I would ask. What I would then ask you to think about is if you had, if you knew that the person who was beating his wife um, had, a, had a gun, if you also had um, four children, and if you knew that you, by you going in to confront this man, you would be killed. And what about your responsibility to your own children? So are you going to put yourself in a position where you are almost certain to be killed, and then your children are left without a parent? And okay. if you add in, add in points like that, it starts to complicate what's, what's a very simple question. We all like to think of ourselves as heroes and Charles Bronson, we break down the door and we do the right thing, but individuals have good reasons at times and morally sound reasons for not doing something that's necessarily the right thing to do. Aidan, I can see we're gonna have trouble with time because everybody wants to ask you a question and I must shut up, but I'm gonna give you one question. So, so, sorry, thank you, Holly, and I hope I haven't cut you too short. Um, we're now in the position, Aidan, where theoretically it won't happen, but just theoretically we could decide that because China is wreaking such havoc over certain places, including Hong Kong, we should simply say withdraw some trade or all trade, despite the huge damage it would do ourselves. So in parallel with your, um, you've got four children at home and the man's got a gun, if we take any positive step against the People's Republic of China, it will bring great cost to us. So, do we have a duty? Well, what you would do in that situation, and what I would do in that situation, might be, might be very different, but I, I know what states will do. I mean, you, you only have to look at how the UK has responded to the, the bombing of Yemen by Saudi Arabia. Sorry, Aidan, you're back in the position of having supernatural powers. What would you do? Me personally, I would not engage in any um, trade with, with a country that was a, a violator of human rights. Absolutely. Thank you very not. much. Let's move rapidly, not rapidly. Amma next, then Francesca, um, and then Adam. So Amma. Okay, hello then. Um, I will connect with the NATO intervention because I think we all agree that the purpose of the NATO, it was to stop the conflict. And uh, we cannot blame the NATO why the state building after the, the conflict it's not development. This is for this are responsible, I think, the politicians who lead the country. So uh, I have one simple question. I agree that it was illegal because we didn't have the veto from Russia and China maybe to intervene to Kosovo. But when we when we see this legality is also direct co connecting with the willingness of the politicians. So this is not something legal. It's just the willings of some uh, state who lead the state like Russia and China. But in other hand, we, we have two options like Jeffrey mentioned before. We have to break the law or to save the life. So you have to choose one. At the end of the day, the laws the laws are built to save for the better life of the people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have any um, problem with breaking the law. <laughs> you know, that's not, um, if, if the law is illegitimate, then you have, you have the right to break it. Um, when, is the law, when is the law illegitimate? Well, I think it was right for Irish people to, to use force to overthrow the British state, for example, if you want to kind of think of it in those terms. So, you know, my history as an Irish person is built on, we reject the, London's rule over, over the Republic of Ireland. And, and we, you know, have, have fought for that. And I think it's fine. And I think the Cosmo Albanians were right to do that. But I also think the Kurds in Turkey uh, were right to do that. I think that the, the, the people in Bahrain who are opposed to the monarchy, um, have, have morally, it's, it's, it's fine for them to do that. So my point about breaking the law isn't you shouldn't do it at all. Um, 
you know, Nelson Mandela broke the law. Um, I think he was a good guy. I don't have a problem. That's the same Gandhi. The point about the law being broken is that you, you, you can't break the law and then say, I broke it and that's okay. And we're going to leave it as it is. And I alone can decide when and where to break these laws. If the law was flawed in 1999, as it clearly was. So people like you from Kosovo who, who you know, grew up under this apartheid regime know more than anybody what it's like to live in a state that is fundamentally oppressive. You know, it would be ridiculous for, for comfortable Westerners to say, well, you know, the Security Council procedures are in place for a reason and you guys just have to suffer it. That would be insane. But having broken the law, it's important to then say, okay, now we need to, to think about means by which this situation doesn't arise again. Now, if you look at what the the US and France and the UK have done since 1999, they've made no effort whatsoever to diminish the power of the Security Council. So they want to reserve for themselves the exception. We want to be the ones who can decide when we break the law. And that seemed to be okay in 1999 because people said, oh, well, the West are good guys. But in 2008, uh, Putin intervened in Georgia and he explicitly said, if you guys can do this in Kosovo, we can do it in Georgia. In 2014, he said exactly the same thing regarding um, the annexation of Crimea. So it's a very dangerous precedent to create, to say the powerful don't have to abide by all the laws. We decide when it's morally right for us to break the law. Now, in the specific case of Kosovo, it worked out very well for the Kosovo Albanians. Most people who've looked into that case, I think, would agree that something had to be done and it was, it was good that it happened. But it, hadn't, it didn't work out so well for people in Iraq. It didn't work out so well for people in, in, in other parts of the world who weren't on the receiving end um, of intervention. Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's see what Francesca wants to ask. Yes, I mean, you mentioned that uh, hum human rights like intervention, humanitarian intervention, depends on state interest and the extent of suffering. My question is, is this really the case? Because today at the EU external border, for instance, in Greece, we have a like, systematic violation of human rights through pushbacks of asylum seekers. And we know this. And yet we still, we still don't have an agreement with Turkey, for instance, which was in our interest in the last five years and which reduced the numbers and improved the situation for asylum seekers in Turkey. And we, we accept the status quo. So is this really state interest or, or is it also something else, like maybe ideology or values? Yeah, yeah, again, that's a good point. It, 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 it does depend on who is in power, I think. You know, it depends on the, you know, the, the, the nature of a state's national interest um, is not fixed in the constitution. It, it does evolve and it, it is a, a function of, you know, as you say, ideology at, at, at different points. And, you know, I think clearly if you were to, um, a lot of people would have, you know, compared the, the, the British foreign policy priorities under John Major with the British foreign policy priorities under Tony Blair, for example, and said there was, a, there was quite a dramatic change in 97. Um, and that wasn't because Britain changed its national interest. There was a political party elected that had a different set of priorities. So, you know, I'm absolutely right that that's something that would have to be factored in, yeah. Um, shall we move to Carol? Would you like to read your question out, Carol? You better unmute your uh, microphone first. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I wonder, Aidan, would you abolish the veto at the Security Council or would you perhaps rearrange or abolish the Security Council altogether and put in a different arrangement? Because I look at the situation in Bosnia where, especially after Clinton came into power, there was an impasse between America on the one side and three of the others, China was out of it, they didn't um, come into any of the decisions at that time, but three on the other side who had a different view, um, basically non-intervention. And because of that, the war continued for another three years. Although many would argue that genocide actually occurred in 1992. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I don't see people, and I would include myself as one of them, people who want to see human rights enforced, who, who believe that, you know, people suffering overseas shouldn't suffer simply because they live in a tyrannical state. I, I think we have to accept that 
we, we will never have the consistent enforcement of human rights if the Security Council maintains the monopoly over the authorization of the use of force. It, it, it simply will not happen. You know, um, and that's always been my point regarding the responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect the, the two paragraphs in the World Summit Outcome document, particularly paragraph 139, explicitly says that the authorization of remedial action has to take place through the Security Council. So it, it recognizes the Security Council's um, you know, primary uh, authority. And it even says on a case by case basis. So built into the actual um, uh, statement, the responsibility to protect the statement that's recognized internationally is selectivity. So we will approach each situation depend, you know, uh, differently. Now, can you imagine the uproar if the, the, the UK police said, we're going to respond to murder on a case by case basis? You know, we'd be like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, you have to respond to these things consistently. You can't say, well, it's okay to kill um, uh, Shia protesters in Bahrain in 2011, but it's not okay to kill uh, Libyans in Benghazi. So we're going to enforce R2P in this situation, but we're not going to enforce in that situation because Bahrain is our chum. You know, and Britain and the, U and the United States need Bahrain, so they're going to overlook the terrible things Bahrain does. And I don't think we can be surprised that this pattern will continue so long as we have the Security Council. Now, the idea of increasing the, the, the size of the Security Council doesn't strike me as being something that will really solve the problem. If you added on, you know, Germany and, and um, South Africa and Brazil or whatever, you, you'd, you'd be adding on more states with more interests. It might be more, even more difficult to achieve consensus. Uh, and I will come back to that fundamental point again about the normative you know, system of law has a separation between the, the executive and the judiciary. You know, you, you, you can't have a situation where inherently political actors are deciding when and where law is enforced. You, you know, we wouldn't accept it domestically if, if, if that was to happen in, in, in the United Kingdom. If, if the judges sitting in cases were politicians, we'd say, well, that, you know, this is a failed state. This is King Henry VIII's time kind of thing. But the Security Council is, is precisely that. Um, so, so long as we have that, I, I can't see that, you know, we can expect anything other than what we have, which is this pattern of inconsistency. Aidan, I want to, uh, thank you very much, Carol. I want you to deal with a proposition uh, you advanced as uh, unquestionable, namely that the undertakings in the Genocide Convention do no more than require states to hand over to international legal bodies and I'd like Arif before you answer see if Arif wants to challenge that because I suspect he would. Yeah. I, I guess I, I did disagree with a, f a few things more than a few things perhaps with Aidan but that's uh, understandable. I mean the way I see it is there are already a lot of rules and obligations in many many international treaties so just taking uh, the Genocide Convention, you heard the talk I gave about the duties, responsibilities and obligations on states set out very clearly there in 1948. Um, so it's a duty to, uh, it's a prohibition on genocide on states, uh, including people who fall within the jurisdiction of the state. There's a duty to prevent genocide. That means before genocide occurs or if it's ongoing, and then there's a duty to punish perpetrators of mm -hmm. genocide by the state itself. Um, and there's also then duty to enact legislation to give effect to provisions yeah. of the Genocide Convention and to make them effective, and also to provide appropriate remedies um, if genocide was to occur. Now, as, as I discussed that length in my presentation, those duties all exist, you know, that there is, there is a need to specify further exactly what it entails, but they are broad, they are owed by each state to one another, and they're also owed to the world at large, because that's the nature of the, of the prohibition on genocide. And the same applies to the Slavery Convention, the same applies to the Convention on Racial Discrimination, the same applies to the Convention on Torture, so those are really serious violations which require action by states. Um, and then that raises the question, well, why, why isn't action forthcoming? 
Is it just the Security Council? I would argue no. There are lots of things states can do in the absence of Security Council consensus. Um, and states are the people that have to do it. You can't, you can't expect um, international relations to um, exist without states both agreeing to do these things and then taking the steps to do them. Uh, and this is an example where states unanimously agree on all the obligations and duties, but it's a question of enforcement. And it's a question on how you ensure enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the issue lies rather than changes on the macro structure. Uh, Thank the you. Yeah. Implementation. Thank you very much, Arif. Aidan, your response to that? Yeah, thanks, Arif. Um, hopefully I can, I can listen to your talk again. I'd, I'd really like to hear it. Um, I, I just don't agree. I mean, I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but my, my reading of it is, is, is that the, um, the Genocide Convention does create um, duties the states are not allowed to do certain things to their own people. And I would fundamentally agree with you about that. It's very clear that you're, you're not allowed to commit genocide. Uh, where, I would, where I would say, I mean, disagree is maybe the wrong word, but where I would maybe have a bit more of a different perspective than, than you is on the, the point regarding what you do if another state is doing it and, and you're a state that sees that this particular state is committing genocide or is about to commit genocide because you mentioned prevention as well. Um, in 1994, with respects to Rwanda, the, the Clinton administration went to great lengths not to use the G word um, to describe what was happening because there was a sense at the time that um, if we call it genocide, we're going to have to get involved. Um, so there was somebody in the, in the US administration at the time whose legal advice was don't call it genocide because there's this bloody genocide convention and if we say it's genocide, we're going to have to get involved. Um, but in 2004, um, Colin Powell, when he was um, Secretary of, of Defence, he said what's happening in Darfur is genocide. And he went on in that speech to say, but let's not get too worked up about this designation. It, it doesn't mean we have to do anything. And he was right. You, you don't have to do anything. You have to bring it to the attention of the Security Council, but you don't have to stop it. Or at least your attempts to stop the genocide are a matter for you to decide as such. Now, I don't see how you can describe something as a duty if, first of all, it's entirely subjective as to how you interpret this duty. And secondly, if there's no punishment for a dereliction of that duty. So if the state commits genocide, will that state automatically be punished for so doing? Clearly the answer is no. And secondly, if a state knows that genocide is taking place in another state, but doesn't do anything about it, who's going to punish them for it? Well, Aidan, the, let me, let the, me the, try and... Well, can I just say about the yeah, International yeah. Court of Justice ruling about, about what happened in Bosnia? Of course. Is that the Serbian state was found to have had the capacity to have helped to prevent genocide in Bosnia and didn't. And that was a very important ruling. But that's not the only instance where this has happened. There's been lots of examples since the Genocide Convention where states have either committed genocide or aided other states in committing genocide or knew that genocide was happening in a state and did nothing about it. And unfortunately, you have this body of law that creates this, this sort of wordplay but actually enforcing it you know to, to my mind it's it's, it's an inherently political and even Kofi Annan admitted that regarding the genocide convention you know so I, I would I would suggest that words on paper don't mean very much if consciously and like I say it's important to say consciously if consciously there has been no attempt made to create a mechanism by which these words on paper can be enforced but Aidan, before, perhaps you could answer this question very shortly, because Adam and Lorraine are get, need to get in and maybe others. Uh, supposing, um, and we're, we're both from England, a neighboring country, let it be France, was known to be gassing uh, to death in the way that happened in Nazi Germany, a minority group, maybe it's Muslims, and nobody else was doing anything. And England had the capacity to mountain invasion and deal with it or do something with airborne power no duty whether under the genocide convention or the moral law no duty if the uk did nothing to stop that it would face absolutely no punishment whatsoever but that's not the question i asked 
Well, it's, uh, you can't say there's a duty if there's no means by which that duty can be punished, because that's, that's just, as I say, that's... Um, that's very, into... I mean, that's a very stark proposition. And I'm, I'm, I understand fully your proposition, but it's very stark. Let's see what Adam wants to ask. Uh, I was, I was going to say, if, if you want to keep um, asking this stuff, I'm quite happy just to listen. I, my question was more about um, the effectiveness of a... Uh, actually, yeah, well, going back to what you said, Aidan, in response to uh, Jeffrey's question earlier, that if you were able to, for half an hour, be able to solve the UN in some, some way, you said you might have like a more empowered UN secretariat. I guess that sort of allowing it to act as a sort of supranational body as opposed to simply a body that's purely consensus driven. Is it ever possible to have a, an empowered UN secretariat which had its own force, its own ability to intervene without necessarily the acquiescence of states, given that the UN is entirely predicated on a very traditional conception of the state being the sort of monopoly of power? I'm not sure whether that's clear, but more just more just dealing with the idea of is because the UN is intrinsically made up of is defined in relation to states, in relation to monopoly of power, as it were, with defining that state. If you added an extra body which did have some sort of monopoly of power to to in effect challenge states, is that ever going to be possible to uh, be created within the UN, or is the UN so fundamentally flawed that it just renders it impossible? Yeah, I think um, it's a very good question. It really is. And I, and I, I really wish more people had, had asked that question 20 years ago, you know, and, and that would have been, like I said, a, a very interesting avenue to go down. I, I feel like I'm, I'm getting just too old and tired of looking into that whole thing. And it's, it's, it's such a, it's so, I mean, it was, it, when I wrote about it 15 years ago, it was difficult to imagine. Now it's inconceivable. The world has changed so much that the idea of, reforming the UN and creating the UN standing army and all these kind of things, it's not going to happen, you know, in maybe 20, 20 years time, if there's something major that, that occurs, but it doesn't mean that people shouldn't write about it and, and look into it because there is a huge amount that needs to be done in that regard. So, you know, to come back to the point that Arif mentioned, you know, when you have the UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, when he says that the Genocide Convention is a dead letter, then you have to take that seriously. You have to say, well, he's not going to make that up. He's got no reason for saying the Genocide Convention is useless, and yet he has. So what's gone wrong here? And that demands that we start to think in terms of creative mechanisms by which we could change, as you say, this, this extremely state-centric international organization from being as state-centric as it is to being more consistent, more impartial, more orientated towards human security rather than state security. And, and the interesting thing about it is that once you start looking into that, there's a massive amount of literature about that, which has been ignored. Because RTP has, has operated as this kind of black hole that sort of sucked in all the energy. Anybody who's interested in human rights, well, you must engage with RTP. And the first thing RTP effectively says to you is you can change the system. Let's just clear, clear, be clear about that. We have to work with the existing system and go this way. And that precludes all the then interesting discussions that people can have about how do you move the Genocide Convention from being this nice sounding document something that actually works rather than it being an embarrassment that you know in, in 2020 the UN has all these wonderful laws that are never enforced how do we move to a means by which they can be enforced and um, it's a very that it, the first thing as I said is that it's highly unlikely to happen but secondly it's important that people do that groundwork I think because it will be useful going forward hopefully and things tend to you know human history particularly in terms of legal developments they, they tend to come from a moment when it's so obvious that the whole system is flawed and it just suddenly collapses. You know, and, 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 and that revolutionary change often happens and, and what seems like a powerful and mutable system is suddenly, you know, on the ash heap of, of, of history. And that's when some new ideas will be necessary. So, you know, I, I think it's very important that people do look into precisely what you said, how you change the nature of the UN system, even if it's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, Aidan, thank you. Uh, I've got Lorena, and Ruby. Uh, I want to check before we finish that Nick Vetch doesn't want to ask questions connecting your thing to what follows. And I'm, I will probably end if I'm allowed with a nice simple question and answer about a film some of us have watched, which gives an, a, a, 
an interesting well a question that I'd like to ask if we have time but let's and, and Arif must get back in as well so but first of all Lorena yeah my question was kind of answered by Arif and Aidan as well but uh, what are the other criteria of responsibility to protect this besides genocide is ethnic cleansing one of them like there are normal yeah. members. Yeah, it's a, again a good question. Well, I mean, like I say, I've, I've spent my life saying RTP is useless, um, but I, I, even I would say it did one useful thing, which was to clarify the, the grounds for intervention. Um, in the 90s, the whole debate about humanitarian intervention was, was very fluid and it wasn't clear when and where you could, you know, people said you could, you could, you could take action. Whereas RTP, when it, when it was recognised in 2005, it had four uh, scenarios, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. So that meant then that you, you had narrowed the scope. So you couldn't undertake a humanitarian intervention because um, a certain religious group weren't allowed to vote, for example, or something like that. Or, you know, the example of, of the, um, the hurricane in um, Myanmar in 2008 was often used there where people say, well, we have a responsibility to protect the government and Myanmar are not providing humanitarian aid for their people. And the, the, the clear consensus that came back from, from the UN General Assembly was, well, it's not part of R2P. You know, humanitarian man-made, sorry, not man-made, uh, natural disasters aren't covered. So it, those are the four, are known as the four crimes, um, genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes and ethnic cleansing. Thank you very much. Ruby. Hi. So my question was just following on from what we were talking about with the political interest of states, because um, of course all of this is, is reasonably academic without the, the correct landscape. Um, you mentioned about in relation to reformation of the UN, possibly in 30 years time, there being some event um, which acts as a catalyst for some kind of reformation of international law and and um, I was just wondering obviously the second world war was a massive catalyst a rush to uh, improve human rights standards around the world I was wondering after the technological revolution that we're obviously going through now and in a very different world where a, a war like the first world war or the second world war probably wouldn't happen again what sort of event you might be envisioning that could potentially lead to a reformation into some of the changes that we've been discussing? Well, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the obvious one is, is some kind of world war, unfortunately, which would be clearly unpleasant for, for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But I think even, even beyond that, you know, again, something that I've often um, spoken about is that people can get I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly brimming over with optimism about human rights protection or the future of humanity, things like that, but I do retain a sense that things can change and, and that, you know, not, not to be um, fatalistic. Well, you know, there's, there's a brilliant essay by Reinhold Neubauer called The Children of Darkness and the Children of Light. And in that, he talks about the fact that you can be realistic and be, you know, um, uh, not have a particularly rosy view of human nature, but still think we can make progress. And I, and I would kind of adhere to that. And, and one of the examples I, I, would, I, I would suggest that does provide a bit of hope is the establishment of the International Criminal Court. That, you know, if you'd said in 1995, um, we're going to have a, a new International Criminal Court, and it's going to be established because Trinidad and Tobago, and if you're a small state, start this idea and the United States is going to mount the most aggressive anti-international criminal court campaign you could imagine and threaten every other state not to get involved with it. And it's still going to be established, despite the fact that the US launched this campaign. Russia doesn't want it to exist and China doesn't want it to exist. If you'd said that in 95, people would have said you were delusional. And yet it exists. You know, I, I've been there. You can walk into the building. It's, 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 it's a functioning court it's not perfect clearly it's not perfect it, it's not immune from political interests uh it still has some of the legacy of the the old system where you have this conflation of politics and law enforcement but it's 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 i'm glad it exists and, and it existed not because powerful states wanted to exist wanted it to exist it existed because a consensus existed amongst less powerful states so if you're one of these kind of cold, hard cynics that says nothing ever changes, the whole thing is 
you know, a, a mess and we're doomed. How do you explain the International Criminal Court? You know, I, I think that's a positive development that, that, that should give us some degree of hope, as I say. Harry wants to get back in, and I want him and uh, Aidan to finish by 14 minutes past, which will give me one minute to thank Aidan, ask my simple question, and break for coffee at uh, a quarter past. Harry. I think, I think Aidan's uh, remarks that he's just made, we probably wholeheartedly agree there. Uh, I mean, there are, there are many young and younger practitioners on this call, and I think it's important to emphasize that it's not this isn't an endeavor that's hopeless and meaningless. <laughs> um, there are many things that you can do, and Aidan's just touched upon some really uh, critical developments that have happened in the last 20 years that have, has actually shown that many of the obligations and responsibilities under the treaties and including under customary international law have, have developed over the last few years. You had the ICTY, you had the ICTR, who would have thought that in 2019, Gambia would bring Myanmar to the International Court, Court of Justice for genocide? You've had uh, UN commissions of inquiry on Syria. You've had the in independent impartial investigative mechanism on Syria. You have a similar one on Myanmar. There is UNITAD, which is investigating crimes of ISIS in Iraq. And these are all mechanisms um, apart from the ICTY and ICTR, that do not require UN Security Council involvement. And in fact, there hasn't been any. And these mechanisms have come about precisely because of inaction at the UN Security Council. So I think there are, and a lot of these initiatives, remember, came about because of NGOs and individuals who campaigned and petitioned for them. So the idea that um, th there isn't anything we can do it, shouldn't be the takeaway from t today's discussion. I don't think Aidan has suggested that at all, but I think that's where something we probably agree on that there are many things you can do under the existing structure, which inevitably will change the existing structure. And that's something that we can only hope continues. Aidan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's never been my intention to, um, make people despondent about human rights. But I, I think it's important to be realistic about the nature of the international system as it is. And people like you and, and the many, many other people who, who know infinitely more about these mechanisms um, than I do, you know, they, they, you can point to, as you've just done, um, real change, tangible developments that, that have occurred in the last 20 years. And, you know, again, I often say to my, my students in, in the UK, if you compare the international legal order today to that which existed in 1895, for example, before like the, the various different tentative moves towards international legal order were, were occurring, it's completely different, you know, and, and, and these are not um, irrelevant developments. It's, it's a good thing we have the UN, it's a good thing we have the ICC. They're not perfect, but they, they are stepping stones. But my, my major point about all of this was to, to, to I suppose, is to convince people that the kind of things that um, Arif has just mentioned that aren't dependent on, you know, former politicians like Gareth Evans and people like that persuading states to do the right thing. You know, those are doomed to fail. You know, that there has to be some, as, as, as he mentioned, impartiality, um, judicial mechanisms, not politically powerful actors thank asking you. states to do the right thing. Uh my last question uh, before I thank you is generated by your observation about the, the right to break an illegitimate law. And I'm stimulated to ask this question because some of us have been watching a film called Billy Budd. You may not have seen it, Aidan, I don't know. But the question is this. In the 18th century, there was a law um, called the Articles of War, which was already known to be far too fierce and led to problems on board naval vessels. A really violently fierce, over fierce laws leading to punishments and killing of sailors. But the country was at war with France. In those circumstances, should the men on a ship mutiny? And if not, why not? The law was 
clearly one that was out of date and illegitimate. Well, I, I, I would have, I mean, as I say, it depends on the individual. I would break a law that I didn't think was legitimate. You know, at the, but, and, and, and putting your country at risk? Well, yeah, I mean, in the same way that, you know, I was just reading David Rhodes' book there in the last week about the massacres of Srebrenica. A lot of the people who killed the, the Muslims in Srebrenica were ordered to do that by their state. They were individual soldiers who were given an order. And some of them refused, very few, but some of them refused. And that was precisely the argument that was put to them. Are you going to imperil your state? But for some people, the orders they're given, the, the, the legal system that they operate under is, is, is flawed and they will break that law. And, and of course, I would like to think I would be one of those people. We'd all like to think that would be heroic, I think, in those kind of situations. But the, the, the sad reality is that most people aren't. Um, Aidan, yeah. thank you very much indeed, Aidan, for a most stimulating morning. I think uh, we, we've achieved a level of vigor and rigor this morning, uh, which we will all remember. If you stay on, uh, we're going to break exactly now and then we're going to meet again for coffee at, uh, not after coffee, at half past. If you stay on then, you'll hear from Nick Betch, and if you, uh, which I hope you might do, uh, and if you do then, you'll be able to challenge him and me on whether there's any value in such things as people's tribunals, maybe. But meanwhile, <laughs> Uh, leaving, uh, because as you know, we're all involved in that to some or greater extent. But meanwhile, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much indeed. And we'll all look forward to re-meeting, well, most of us, I hope all of us, at exactly half past. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. Very, very good questions. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.